we want. So we'll start from the beginning. Today we are going to discuss the infections of the oral cavity. And we know the infections in our region is not something uncommon. We see different types of infection in our day-to-day -day life. Most of them are, are coming from the tooth or the tooth supporting structures. Today, I'm not going to discuss the infections coming from the tooth and the tooth supporting structures. We are going to discuss the, the infections coming from the skin and the mucous membrane in orofacial region. Skin and the mucous membrane in orofacial region, they, they are getting affected by the different types of organisms, including viral, bacterial, fungal, helminthic, different types of infections. And some of these infections are very small and localized, whereas sometimes it can be diffuse as well as invading into the surrounding tissues. Most of the, the time, the lesions may not be very serious, whereas there are times where the infection can be very serious. And sometimes it can be life-threatening and even the patient may die because of that. When we take the infections, they are not spread out all over the country, all over the world in the same way. Certain type of infections are much common in a certain type of areas. For example, if you take something like leishmaniasis, it is commonly seen in areas where the, the temperature is very high and where there is a lot of sand, the desert areas. Even in Sri Lanka, if you take the leishmaniasis, it is much commonly seen in Andhra Pradesh area, whereas the other part of the country, it is not that common. These infections may cause significant discomfort to the patient and sometimes the patient may be suffering a lot because of that. As there are different types of infection and some of them can mimic various other lesions, it is important for us to recognize the clinical presentation. And that is important not only for the diagnosis, but also management as well as appropriate referrals. Certain type of infection coming in the mucous membrane and the skin of our region we may we alone may not be able to manage the patient. So therefore, the appropriate referrals are mandatory. It is very important to assess and interpret the clinical signs and symptoms, individual and community predisposition, past medical, dental, surgical, as well as the social history of the patient. And finally, the laboratory results that we are going to get in these patients. And we have to realize not only the infectious agent that is causing the problem. And once the infectious agents enter into our body, there will be a reaction from our own body, an inflammatory reaction. And this inflammatory reaction is protective and defensive in nature. The main purpose of this inflammatory reaction is to eliminate the infectious pathogen. And sometimes it is very beneficial it will eliminate the infectious agent and there will be a recovery, repair and tissue injury. Whereas there are times where this inflammatory reaction can be very serious. It may be harmful. It can give rise to hypersensitivity and autoimmune disease. If I give you an example, rheumatic fever is one of those. The rheumatic fever is due to a, a simple throat infection. Actual disease is not caused by the, the infection. But the inflammatory reaction that we get due to the simple throat infection can give rise to a serious disease like rheumatic fever. So first we will discuss the viral infections and viral related disease. There are different types of viral infections and viral related disease in the head and neck area. And these viruses are associated not only with the inflammatory and non specific systemic conditions, Sometimes it is associated with the neoplasia, oral cancer. Especially in the, the West, they have identified a relationship between the human papilloma virus and the oropharyngeal cancer. That is one very good example. If you take the viral infections that we are going to see in the oral cavity, the commonest is the herpes virus infections. 
In addition to that, we may see the herpangina, hand, foot and mouth disease inside the oral cavity. These are the common viral infections that we get in our day-to-day -day practice. Herpes virus group is the most important virus group for us. Most of the viruses can give rise to a problem in the oral cavity. Oral cavity. Herpes virus, virus type 1 is predominantly seen in the, the oral area, whereas you can get it in the genital area as well. Herpes simplex virus HSV type 2 is seen in the oral cavity as well as in the genital area, but predominantly in the genital area. Varicella zoster is the virus which is responsible for the chicken pox. Reactivation of the virus can give rise to shingles. Epstein-Barr virus or the herpes virus type 4 cause many diseases, many problems, including the infectious mononucleosis, Burkitt's lymphoma, central nervous system lymphoma, and oral hairy leukoplakia. Type 5 cytomegalovirus is responsible for infectious mononucleosis-like symptoms. And not only that, it can give rise to a pathology in the salivary gland as well, cytomegalovirus inclusion disease. Type, one, type 6 is human herpes virus type 6, or called as roseola associated herpes virus, and herpes, why herpes type 7 is unnamed, and both these 6 and 7 can give rise to roseola infections. Type 8, or what we called as Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus, is associated with neoplasm, the Kaposi sarcoma, as well as primary effusion lymphoma. Most of the herpes viruses, they have a special feature where the virus can stay inside the nerve root ganglions and later they can get reactivated and then they can travel along the nerve root of that particular uh, nerve and giving rise to the local disease. Primary disease is a systemic disease, whereas the reactivated disease is localized disease. So when the patient is get exposed to the virus, the patient develop a viremia. And during the time where the patient is developing the viremia, the patient will be symptomatic, but the patient is spreading the disease to the other. And then the patient is getting the prodromal stage associated with the viremia. So the prodromal stage, the features will be generalized and they will be done specific. The patient will get fever, malaise, body aches, headaches, difficulty in eating, which will last only for a two to three days time. And after two to three days time, the body immune system will take place and they will start attacking the viruses. So now what will happen? The viral will have an effect on the areas where they have a special affinity. So in our case, that will give rise to the oral ulceration. Then the immune system will look after that part as well. Their patient will get a resolution. One thing, most of these viral infections, the patient will get the immunity. So therefore, the patient will not get the second attack. But before the patient develops the immunity, the virus can shed its capsule, run along with the sensory nerve to the sensory nerve root ganglion, and the virus can stay there for a longer period of time. Sometimes it may be two years, three years, five years, 10 years. And after a long latency period, when the patient is subjected to immunosuppression or severe stress, the virus can get reactivated, giving rise to recurrent disease. Herpes simplex type 1 and type 2 can cause problems in the oral cavity, head and neck area. Severity of the disease will depend on the immunity of the patient. If the patient is immunocompetent, then the, the disease will smile, whereas in immunocompromised patient, the disease can cause significant uh, problems. Acute herpetic gingivostomatitis which is the disease due to the HSV type 1 and type 2, especially the type 1 when you get it in the oral cavity. It's a very common manifestation. And it's seen in young children. In our setup, it's generally seen in children who are attending the preschools. We know our sanitary facilities are not good. They are overcrowded. So therefore, the virus spreads very quickly in the daycare centers where they are, the children are living uh, very close one to the other. So once the child is exposed to the, the virus, the child will have an incubation period and then the patient will develop, the child will develop 
prodromal stage with high fever, irritability, inability to eat, and later the, uh, the fever settles, patient develops the oral ulceration. And when you look at the mouth, you will see the oral ulcerations, which usually start at vesicles, but when they come to us, we hardly see the vesicle. We see aptus-like ulcers in the oral cavity, mostly in the tongue, buccal mucosa, or in the palate, but it may extend to the lip or even into the face. One of the characteristic feature which helps in the diagnosis, as well as giving the name, is the gingivitis. So these people will have the severe gingivitis. That is why we call it as acute herpetico gingivostomatitis. In addition to that, the patient can have cervical lymphadenopathy as well. So these are some examples of uh, the children who are presenting to us with the, the lesion. And when you look at that, it looks like aptus ulceration. But the aptus ulceration, number one, is not common at this age. Number two, the aptus ulceration is recurrent in nature. Whereas the primary gingivitis somatitis is not uh, recurrent in this form. So this is the characteristic appearance in the gingiva. You will see uh, gingivitis, reddish, swollen gingiva, which is few days uh, duration. Investigations. Most of the time we don't need any investigation. The diagnosis is clinical. But whenever there is a doubt, we can go for a simple investigations like full blood count, which will show us the viral infection features. But one has to remember the features that you get in the, the full blood count, they will tell us that the child is having a viral infection, but it will not tell us that the child is having the HSV infection. Then we can go for a smear or a brush biopsy where we will see the balloon degeneration and multinucleated giant cells under the microscope. Again, all these are uh, viral uh, features of viral infection and they are non-specific. We can go for immunology, elevated antibody levels, which is very specific. But unfortunately, the significant elevation of the antibodies will happen once the disease is under control or once the disease is healed. So therefore, actual clinical value of immunology is very limited. But if the child is immunocompromised, the disease can stay longer than what it usually stays. The primary gingivitis stomatitis in immunocompetent child, the disease will be healed within three to four days time. Whereas when the disease lasts for weeks, we may have a problem with the diagnosis. In that case, the immunology will be helpful. Viral culture. The negative viral culture will tell us the child is not having the HSV infection. Positive culture will not tell us whether this is the transient virus present in the mouth or whether it is the infective agent. Treatment, symptomatic. There's no need for us to use antiviral therapy in a child who is having primary gingivitis stomatitis. All what we have to do is to look after the pain, look after the hydration, look after the fever, as, <coughs> sorry, as well as the oral hygiene. That's all what we have to do in three to four days time. The disease improves and the child will be fine in three to four days time. But if the child is immunocompromised, then we have to consider giving acyclovir as the treatment. So the person who had the primary gingivitis stomatitis, the virus can run along the nerves, along the trigeminal nerve and it can get later in the trigeminal nerve and later, it can present as a lesion in the lip, which is called as herpes labialis. You can see small, small vesicles which will rupture. And the patients may get this in the lip time to time. It is localized and it is unilateral. So that is the feature which will help us in diagnosing. And it will stay only a few days. The vesicles will rupture and then it will have an automatic healing after a few days time. And if the patient is getting recurrent herpes labialis, we have to consider, uh, we have to see whether the patient is immunocompromised. Where is the last system? So this is the reactivated disease of the chickenpox. We know the chickenpox, you can get it <coughs> anywhere in the body. And the virus can travel along 
either the trigeminal nerve, which is the commonest, or the sensory nerve root of the, uh, the facial nerve. Generally, what we get is the involvement of the trigeminal nerve, and you can have the involvement of either the, the ophthalmic branch, maxillary branch, or the mandibular branch. When the ophthalmic branch get involved, there will be eye involvement, and that is serious because the ulceration, the corneal ulcers can heal with the scarring and then later on it can give rise to the blindness. So therefore the moment we suspect it to be uh, the herpes zoster due to the, the uh, herpes, system, herpes zoster involved in the ophthalmic branch, we have to refer the patient to ophthalmologist to check the, the eye. And then we have the Ramsey hand syndrome where the virus is got latent in the geniculate ganglion, the ganglion of the facial nerve. And when it gets reactivated, it will give rise to the vesicles and ulcerations in the ear, as well as in the posterior part of the face. And more importantly, it can give rise to a facial palsy. The most important complication of herpes zoster is the post-herpetic neuralgia. Now, the post-herpetic neuralgia is the continuation of the pain from the day that the, the ulcers are sealed and you have to have a minimum of three months of pain. Some people say it is three months, but usually we take it as, some people say it is six months, but usually we take it as three months. So if the patient had the herpes zoster last week and if the patient comes to us with the pain today, it cannot be post-herpetic neuralgia. And if the patient is having pain while the patient is having herpes zoster or immediately afterwards, these are prone people to develop post-herpetic neuralgia. So therefore, the pain management, prevention of further damage to the nerve and getting the post-herpetic neuralgia is really important. So these are some photographs showing the involvement of the face, trigeminal area, you can see the involvement of the mandibular branch, the maxillary branch, extraoral as well as intraoral approach. Most of the time, the people are having these characteristic vesicles in the face, the facial skin. But there are times where the involvement of the facial skin is very minimal, and you see more ulcers inside the oral cavity, in the oral mucous membrane. And then the diagnosis is a little difficult. One feature which we have to remember herpes zoster is always unilateral. So therefore you will see a very nice demarcation in the palate. If you look at uh, in the mid picture, you can identify the palate. The ulcers not crossing the midline. It is localized into one side. So that is a feature which will tell us, okay, whether this patient is having the case of herpes zoster. And when the patient is having herpes zoster, as I told you earlier, it is very important for us to prevent the patient getting the post-herpetic neuralgia. So therefore, it is mandatory to start the acyclovir as soon as possible in order to prevent the patient going into the post-herpetic neuralgia. And you can add amitriptyline, which is the drug of choice. And if the amitriptyline is not working, then you can consider using other uh, anti-epileptic treatment as and gabapentin to prevent the patient is getting the post-herpetic neuralgia. Hand, foot and mouth disease, is a common disease and time to time you will see compared to the primary gingivopeticostomatitis hand foot and mouth disease is a seasonal disease when during the dry season you will see the hand foot and mouth disease outbreaks whereas the primary gingivopeticostomatitis is seen all over the, the year again it is commonly seen in children caused by enterovirus group a coxsackie virus and sometimes by the group b coxsackie virus as well the features, the patient will have the incubation period, followed by the prodromal stage, characterized by the fever and the sore throat. And then the patient is developing oral ulcers and the rash in the hand and feet. The management, again, the symptomatic management, and it heals within days without much of a complication. But when you get this in adults, then the complications can be much more than in children. So this is the characteristic feature. The oral ulceration is like the aptus ulcers. Uh, al number of ulcers are less than the primary gingivopeticostomatitis, and you can see the characteristic rash in the hand. Herpangina is a milder form, 
and herb angina most of the time the ulceration is characteristically seen characteristically seen in the posterior part of the mouth the rest of the features are more towards the hand foot and mouth disease other than the involvement of the hand again the management is symptomatic if you look at the primary gingivitis stomatitis ulceration is present all over the mouth whereas in the herb angina it is present in the posterior mouth soft palate area number of pulses in primary gingivitis stomatitis is higher whereas in the herb angina it is less and if you look at one ulcer herb angina ulcers are much smaller compared to the primary gingivitis stomatitis then we'll come to the infectious mononucleosis which is due to the epstein barr virus i am not going to go into the details of infectious infectious mononucleosis and few points for us to remember regarding the infectious mononucleosis it is seen in the young children it's called as kissing disease because it is uh, uh, spreading in the young children and it is also called as glandular fever because it gives rise to a characteristic lymphadenopathy so most of the time the patients are presenting to us with the lymphadenopathy and in addition to that they can have a serious tonsillar enlargement and sometimes even we may have to intubate the patient because of the uh, the, uh, the enlarged tonsils obstructing the airway one of the most important features regarding the infectious mononucleosis this can have a miss that the reports can have a misinterpretation and sometimes because the features are, are very similar infectious mononucleosis can be identified wrongly as lymphomas or the other way around so we have to be very uh, uh, very sure when we are uh, treating the patients for infectious mononucleosis what happens most of the time not most of the time sometimes the people are diagnosing only with the full blood count and the blood picture in order to diagnose infectious mononucleosis we need the antibody test positive pole banner test is the the most important test and the monospot test so these antibody tests are characteristic and they are helpful in diagnosing again most of the time it is a self limiting disease but there are times where the patient can have a disseminated disease and it can be very fatal oral hair leukoplakia i discuss oral hair leukoplakia in detail when i discuss the leukoplakia it is a infection caused by the epstein barr virus again and mostly seen in people who are immunocompromised especially in people who are having hiv when we see oral hair leukoplakia we have to consider the possibility of hiv infection as well term hair leukoplakia is not correct it's we it's even though we say it is hair it's not hair all the time and even though we call it as leukoplakia it is not a leukoplakia either so this is a, a patient with hair leukoplakia involved in the lateral borders of the tongue this is the commonest place for one to have hair leukoplakia but you can have the similar appearance elsewhere in the mouth as well and you don't have to do anything for this only thing we have to identify whether the patient is immunocompromised and if it is the case the management will be the management of the immunocompromised state and once you correct it the patient the condition will improve then we have the hpv infection now here i am not going to discuss the hpv infection associated with oropharyngeal carcinomas so i am going to discuss the simple hpv infections that we see in the oral cavity commonly so these are the three common types of hpv infections that we see uh, commonly number 1 the verruca number 2 is the condyloma number 3 is the papilloma and these three are having three uh, important clinical appearances so if you take the verruca it is having upside down v appearance whereas the condylomata they have a sideways c appearance whereas the papilloma it is a pedunculated appearance like a p or mushroom appearance so by looking at it you will be able to recognize identify these three lesions and one can, one can ask is it important to recognize differentiate one from the other yes because they are different in their behavior now you can see the top photograph is the verruca you can see the v appearance and the other you can identify it is a condylama because it has a c appearance 
Now this describe the different characteristics of different viral infections, the HPV infections. And you can see the condyloma accumulatum is a sexually transmitted disease, whereas the other two, papilloma and verruca vulgaris or the wart, are not sexually transmitted disease. So if the person is having the condylarma in the oral cavity, the patient may be having the genital disease and the, the, the screening of the partner is also important in the management. And all these three, what papilloma and the condylarma, all these are not having any increased risk for cancer development. <coughs> right, now we will move into the fungal disease. There are different types of fungal infections. And some of these fungal infections can cause serious problems and it can cause mucosal ulceration, erosion, lymphadenopathy, cyanonasal disease, and it can even spread up to the brain and even it can kill a person. So fungal infections can be divided into two, superficial fungal infections and deep fungal infections. When we say superficial fungal infection, most of the time we are discussing the candidosis under this. Then we have the deep fungal infection, and there are different types of deep fungal infections, which is not very common, but time to time we may see the deep fungal infections as well. Deep fungal infection, the fungi is mostly spreads via the pores and we inhale them and it comes with our respiratory system. So therefore these fungal infections are commonly seen in the respiratory tract. In our region, the most important area for us to get the fungal disease is the sinus. And not only the sinus, sometimes you can get them in the nose, the posterior part of the nose, oropharynx, nasopharynx, and the posterior mouth, soft palate, base of the tongue area. So those are the common area for us to get the fungal disease. So, so, fungal disease you get in the sinus cavities, there are different types. We have the chronic indolent invasive sinusitis, and uh, fulminant fungal sinusitis, fungus bowl, and allergic sinusitis. And their behavior is different from one to the other. Now, for example, if you take the fungus bowl, it's mostly seen in immunocompetent people. And it is like a bowl. The fungus is well localized. So therefore, the prognosis is very good. Whereas the first two types, indolent invasive sinusitis, especially, you see it in people who are being immunosuppressed, and they are like a malignancy. They spread everywhere, they destroy all the tissues, goes all over, and it will kill the person. And then we have the allergic fungal sinusitis. This is allergic reaction against the fungi. So therefore, in management of the allergic fungal sinusitis based with steroids, because it is an allergic reaction. And when it comes to this, the deep fungal infections, the people, the first thing we have to identify whether the patient is immunocompromised. Most of the majority of the people who are having these deep fungal infections, they are people with immunocompromised state. So unless we control that, the, the, we will not be able to control the spread of the infection. Clinical findings alone is not good enough. To diagnose, we need the proper mycological diagnosis. Identification of the exact organism is very important because we have to go for systemic antifungals in this case. Proper systemic antifungal with minimal side defect is very important. And then we have to identify, we have to have CT and MRI findings to localize the lesion. Whenever we have to go for the, the surgery, we have to do it with the CT and the MRI findings. So these are some examples for the cases where the patient is presenting with the deep fungal infections and you can see the involvement of the sinus destroying the sinus walls and this patient is a little unusual case the this boy presented to us with a lymphadenopathy and then this uh, this is relatively little common type of a uh, uh, deep fungal infection histoplasmosis and these people are having the oral ulceration non-healing oral ulcers mimicking oral cancer but one characteristic feature, they are very painful. Seen in the posterior mouth and they are, are very painful. Then we will come into the oral candidosis. Oral candidiasis and oral candidosis. You can see even here, I have used the term uh, in one place the candidiasis and one place candidosis. I did it purposefully because there's a confusion regarding the terms candidiasis and candidosis. 
A lot of people like the term candidiasis, and that is the term which is uh, very commonly used in the literature. But if you go by the proper definition, the appropriate term will be the candidosis. Simply because if you take all the other fungal infections, they will end up with tosis. Histoplasmosis, cocaidomycosis, aspergillosis, and then why not candida? So therefore, the appropriate terminology will be candidosis, but the people use it uh, in a different way. But this is not the proper way to write it. Either you use the candidiasis or you use candidosis, not both at the same time. The oral candidosis can be divided into two types. We have the type 1 oral candidosis, and then we have the type 2 mucocutaneous candidosis with or without oral involvement, which I'm not going to touch. It's a rare and life-threatening condition, and chances of us getting the people with this is minimal. Whereas oral candidosis is very common. And there are different definitions, different classifications for oral candidosis. We, we used to classify them as pseudomembranous, uh, acute, chronic, and candida-associated lesions, but now mostly we uh, divide them into you divide them into pseudomembranous, erythematous, and hyperplastic candidosis. These are the three primary types of candidosis. And then we have the candida-associated lesions, dentures stomatitis, angular chelitis, median rhomboid glossitis, and linear gingival erythema. Oral candidosis is not a single clinical entity. So we have different uh, primary forms. One has to remember, the candida is a normal common cell. A larger number of people are harboring candida as a normal common cell in the mouth. And why the people are getting a disease if it is a normal common cell in the mouth? So in order to get the disease in the, the oral cavity, there has to be a change. And this change may be a local chain or it may be a systemic change. There are different local host factors which may be associated with the virulence of the organism, it may be associated with the barriers like the saliva or the epithelium. And then it may be associated with the systemic changes, mostly the immune system. Simply, for one to get prevented from the candida invading and causing the disease, causing the disease, we have to have the active immune system running primary, secondary, and tertiary immune system. So whenever we have issue with one of those immune systems, the patient is at a risk of getting the, the infection candidosis. Pseudomembranous candidosis, so what we called as oral thrush, it's very commonly seen in small children, neonates, as well as the elderly. They say it's about five to 10% of the neonates and elderly are having oral candidosis, but fortunately, most of the time it is not causing much of a problem. And it goes, comes and goes without much of an issue. But there are times where this pseudomembranous candidosis spreads backwards and even into the throat, even into the esophagus, causing uh, difficulties uh, in these people. The characteristic feature in oral thrush, it forms a pseudomembrane, like yogurt in the oral cavity. Um, it's very easy to diagnose. You take a piece of gauze or a piece of cotton, wipe it. This white plaque, you can take it out. And when you take it out, you will see a red bleeding base. So that is the characteristic feature uh, in the, di the diagnosis of pseudomembranous candidosis. And you can take a swab from it, swab from the plaque, and then you can send it for microbiology, direct microscopy, as well as the culture. So this is the appearance that you get. Pseudomembranous candidosis is a very common finding in people who are in the HIV. Not only the HIV, any immunocompressed, immunocompressive state, you can get this. Then we have the erythematous, so the atrophic candidosis, so what we call as antibiotic soma. This is seen in people who are taking long-term broad-spectrum antibiotics or steroids. What happened here, the entire mouth is becoming reddish, so, and this is the only type of candidal infection which is painful. So these people will have reddish mouth, which is very painful. So like this.
you can see the mouth is very pain, uh, very reddish and atrophic and the patient is having a lot of pain and once you stop the the antibiotic and then the recolonization will take place and after a while the patient will get the improvement without much of an intervention then we have the chronic hyperplastic candidosis or what we called as candida leukoplakia because chronic hyperplastic candidosis and leukoplakia they looks one and the same it is very difficult for us to differentiate one from the other clinically and not only that even under the microscope what happens when the patient is having a leukoplakia they can get candidal super infection and you can have chronic hyperplastic candidosis so the candidal leukoplakia where the primary cause is candida so the only way to differentiate what from one from the other is the treatment with antifungal drugs and see whether the lesion is disappearing if it is chronic hyperplastic candidosis which is associated with candida when you treat it properly it will disappear completely whereas the leukoplakia it will not happen there's a possibility of a development of cancer squamous cell carcinoma from chronic hyperplastic candidosis as well unless you treat it this can happen this is one example uh, for a chronic hyperplastic candidosis even though this looks like a plaque like in the previous case you can see here it is much more thick plaque and you cannot wipe it out in this case then we have the candida associated lesions the most important candida associated lesion is the dentures stomatitis what earlier called as chronic erythematous candidosis the patient will have a denture without the denture or orthodontic appliances the patient will not have denture associated stomatal candida infection so the patient has to have it generally we see it in the maxilla but time to time you may see them in the uh, the mandible as well there are different types here you can see the three different types these are called as newtons type newtons type 1 which you will see in the single photograph on to the the left side where you will see pinpoint erythemas and in the type 2 you will see the diffuse erythema the entire area is red and if you look at this second photograph you can identify the denture bearing area very clear so that is the characteristic feature this you will see only under the the denture and the third type is the uh, newtons type 3 or the papillary hyperplasia where you can see the papillary projections in the palate and time to time this can mimic a malignancy not only clinically even under the microscope because this may be associated with pseudo epitheliomatous hyperplasia and when you have that you may have to take it out surgically otherwise construction of a denture uh, may not be that uh, easy angular keloides again a candida associated lesion about 40% of the angular keloides are due to candida 40% of them are due to staphoris and the rest of it the 20% is a combination of both so you, you can see here when the patient is most of the time these people are having overclosure reduced vertical dimension which promotes the accumulation of saliva and that will erode there will be ulceration and then you will get the candidal or the staphoris super infection uh, causing angular keloides the myconazole is the drug of choice here because the myconazole act against not only against the candida but also against the staphoris then we have the median rhomboid glossitis linear gingival erythema so this is median rhomboid glossitis now even though we call it as median rhomboid glossitis one has to remember it is not always median and it is not always rhomboid but you will get the glossitis now if you look at the photograph in the right corner you will see it is not rhomboid in shape and it's basically uh, involved in most of the the tongue whereas the the first the middle picture the first top picture is more towards the rhomboid shape and really you can have uh, the exophytic development as well most of the time it is atrophic like the three photographs in the top but, but sometimes you can see the proliferative lesions and those can mimic a malignancy 
but having a malignancy squamous cell carcinoma in this place is very unusual so whenever we have this we have to consider the possibility of median rhomboidocytes due to candida uh, giving rise to the papillary projection exactly like what we get in uh, the danger induced stomatitis the last one is the linear gingival erythema or what we call as red band gingivitis another type of candida associated lesion which is not very common very rare and this is mostly seen in people who are having immunocompromised status especially the hiv this is very much common in people who are having hiv the diagnosis of candidal infections are often made with the history and the clinical examination but whenever there is a doubt you can go for the laboratory investigations we can go for a direct smear and then we can go for the culture and whenever there is a doubt now for example even a chronic hyperplastic candidosis or a patient who is having a papillary projections in the thigh uh, the tongue we may have to go for a biopsy uh, because the clinical uh, features alone may not be helpful in the diagnosis treatment the most important aspect in treating the people who are having the candidal infection is the underlying the predisposing factor and correcting them if you can identify it and correct it then there will be a natural healing and the patient will be improve in days or the weeks but if you can't correct it if you can't identify it or if you can't correct it then we have to go for antifungal treatment there are different types of antifungal treatment you can go for topical antifungal treatment with lesser side effects but their effect is not guaranteed on the other hand we have the systemic antifungals and you can control your effect very much but unfortunately most of them are having serious side effects so the topical you can go for nistatin four times a day for one to two weeks but unfortunately the nistatin is having a very bad taste and most of the people they say that they can't tolerate the nistatin but it's a very good drug then we have the amphotericin lozenges again we can use four times a day o myconazole gel four times a day for two to three weeks so those are the the common topical preparations we have the systemic preparations ketoconazole fluconazole etraconazole amphotericin but all these are having lot of side effects especially they are hepatotoxic nephrotoxic and cardiotoxic out of the lot the fluconazole is the one with the lesser side effect so therefore if the patient is having candidal infection or the infection confined to the oral cavity the superficial infection then the drug of choice will be fluconazole because the ketoconazole etraconazole and amphotericin are having uh, side effects and even the patient may die because of these side effects you have to keep a very close eye monitor the patients uh, very regularly right so as the time is a factor i will stop at this point uh, i don't think that i will be having time to discuss the bacterial infection and the other infections like helminthing infections protozoal infections but one has to remember there are different types of infections which are not common and whenever you see consider the possibility of a infection as well if you don't have any other explanation thank you thank you very much sir so can you hear me yeah i can ha ah, okay thank you very much sir um, machines are uh, act weird and uh, sometimes uh, beyond our control and uh, we are extremely sorry for the interruption caused at the initiation thank you for staying connected uh, with the eighth webinar hosted by faculty of dental sciences to the affair of the sri lanka so i am dr sumudhi madhavala from faculty of dental sciences i fail in my duty if i do not introduce our speaker tonight as we had a audio issue at the beginning he is an uh, eminent oral medicine specialist in the country professor ruanil jayasinghe so thank you very much for your wonderful presentation so professor ruan jayasinghe is currently attached to the department of oral medicine and periodontology faculty of dental sciences and he carries out his uh, duties as uh, chair professor chair professor chair in the department so uh, he he 
he joined the department and uh, carries out his duty as an academic for nearly two decades. Two decades. Also, he's a board certified uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeon, diverted his interest to oral medicine and uh, oral medicine. Uh, he made his valuable contribution to numerous academic forums uh, nationally and internationally and received uh, multiple awards, about, including multiple presidential awards. Uh, also, he published more than 70 national and international research publications. So his interest is on oral cancer and oral potentially malignant disorders. So now it's uh, time for the question and answer session. May I take uh, questions one by one? Yes. So there are many questions. Sir. Yeah, I can see there are so many. Yeah. <laughs> I will try my best to answer uh, in my ability. Okay, sir. So the first uh, question uh, is on uh, videos, these videos. Uh, please uh, subscri subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel of Faculty of Dental Sciences. You will find all these videos uh, there. So, and uh, future presentations and future sessions as well. So, uh, please uh, keep up, uh, be updated. Thank you. So, next question is from uh, Dr. Tushar Fonseca. We know that acyclovir is used in various strengths in treatment of oral viral infections. What is the dose which we should use in these oral viral infections? Right, okay, good. Uh, actually, I, I should have mentioned this during my presentation, but unfortunately I have not. So thank you very much for asking the question. Now, when we are giving the acyclovir, there are two important places where we use acyclovir. One is whenever we are suspecting herpes zoster, the other whenever we are suspecting the uh, herpes simplex viral infection. Primary gingivopeticus stomatitis, we generally don't use acyclovir, but whenever the patient is presenting with erythema multiforme, which, which may be due to the, uh, the herpes simplex virus, we use acyclovir. So if you are suspecting herpes simplex virus, the dose of acyclovir is 200 milligrams five times a day for five days. Whereas if you are having herpes zoster, the dose is 800 milligrams five times a day for one week. So here we go for one week, whereas for HSV, we stop at five days. So you can see there's a huge difference between the doses. And uh, remember the acyclovir is not uh, an easy drug to tolerate. A lot of people complains that drug is intolerable. And when you are giving 800 milligrams, the, the people will find, and not only 800, it is five times a day. So it is very difficult. Okay, thank you, sir. So this question is from uh, Dr. Jayant Kumar. Sir, would you suggest the usage of corticosteroids for herpes loss to management in the age group of patients vulnerable to post herpetic neuralgia? And uh, we have similar comment uh, on anon from an anonymous attendee, the use of steroids, on steroids to prevent uh, post-herpetic neuralgia in elderly patients having herpes zoster is uh, still debatable. Do you have any experience or comment on this? Thank you. Yes, uh, as the, the, the person says, it is a debatable area. <coughs> So there are people who are using the steroids. I have used it one or two patients. Only thing, whenever we are using the steroid to prevent the post-herpetic neuralgia, we have to remember two important points. Number one, why the patient develop herpes zoster? And most of the people who develop herpes zoster, they develop it because of the, the diabetes. They are becoming immunosuppressive due to the diabetes. And some of them, they don't know that they are having diabetes. So you have to make sure that the patient is not diabetic, either known or unknown. So please make sure that the patient is not a diabetic. That is number one. Number two, we have to make sure that the patient is not having the running virus. So if the patient is infective, if the virus is active, by giving a course of steroid, you may aggravate the problem and the infection may last longer. So then you have to continue to use the acyclovir have for a longer duration than the other. So, <coughs> sorry. So if you are going to use acyclovir, if you are going to use steroids, the best 
is to wait until you complete your course of phase cyclia and make sure the patient is not having immunocompressive state which will prolong the infection, then you can start. But in my experience, the best drug for the, the prevention of uh, post apoptotic neuralgia is amitriptyline. If you start amitriptyline at the early stage, it's very helpful. Okay, thank you, sir. So next question <coughs> is from uh, Maria Rayon, and uh, which is a very timely question. So, what about SARS-CoV-2 oral manifestation in oral mucosae? What would it involve, sir? Very good question. And if I have to answer the question, what I have to say, I don't know much. Simply because we have not seen the patient. I have not seen a single patient with uh, the COVID. And uh, the information has not come out yet. There are a few findings. Number one, there is one important article which describes the, the involvement of the salivary glands. And it very clearly says the virus can remain in the salivary gland and shed for a longer period of time. So that is one. Number two, there are enough, uh, there are enough reports regarding the oral laceration, especially the posterior mouth involvement in the COVID-19. Only thing, we are not very sure whether these are the primary infection causing the ulceration in the oral cavity or it is the secondary infections which is causing the oral cavity. But I am very sure once uh, the, the oral features are assessed and they will come up with the answers to uh, uh, this question in the near future. Most of the time the dental surgeons were not very much dealing with the people who are suspected of having COVID simply because our field is considered to be one of the, the riskiest field. Uh, so our experience is very limited in the area. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So this question is from an anonymous attendee. Sir, can the condition of gingiva in herpetic uh, gingostomatitis be termed as necrotizing gingivitis? If not, can you please explain the difference of appearance of the gingiva in herpetic gingiostomatitis with necrotizing gingivitis. Now, this is not necrotizing. If you get the necrotizing gingivitis, you will see the gingiva loss. Now, one condition where you get the necrotizing gingivitis is anuk, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis or the periodontitis. Now here, if you look at that, a person with anuk, you will see the destruction of the gingiva especially at the gingival pathway. That is the, the place where there is less attachment. It is the softest place. So the patient is having that and you will see the blackish triangles appearing is there. Uh, so therefore, it's very easy to differentiate. In primary gingival stomatitis, you will see the reddish swollen gingiva. It's like a normal gingiva. There is no actual ulcerations present or the ulceration, so the destruction of the gingiva in that case. Whereas in the necrotizing gingivitis, there will be necrosis, destruction, and most of the time with the necrosis, the patient will present with halitosis. Whereas here, it is not. One of the, the most important differential diagnosis in primary gingivitis stomatitis is leukemia. So we have to be very careful. This age group can get leukemia. So we have to be a little careful in that. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, this question is from uh, Lakshan Galagamarachi. Sir, does the HSV group of viruses always enter into a latent phase? in the nerve ganglia in all patients following infection? Uh, not all viruses goes into that. So the two common viruses which goes and cause the problem, number one is uh, the chickenpox or the herpes zoster virus. The other one is HSV, herpes simplex virus. So these two are the viruses which causes the problem. Whereas the other viruses where the infection is mostly happening via the lymphatics, they will not do that. Now, for example, if you take the Epstein-Barr virus, the involvement of the 
mucosae or the nerves are limited it mostly happens through the infective uh, the immune system so therefore it will not happen in there usually it happens in the two the hsv and the zoster that goes there but if you look at each and every patient who is having chicken pox whether this each and every person is having the latent virus in the nerve root ganglion we don't know uh, simply unless they present with herpes zoster there is no way to check it or the other way take the so once you can do it in the cadaveric studies then you have to do it then and there it's very difficult so i don't know okay sir thank you very much sir so this this is a request actually sir so request on a repetition so would you please repeat how you decide the pain in post herpetic or not the prevention of post herpetic neuralgia so is that the question uh, no sir so she actually she needs uh, how to decide the pain is post herpetic neuralgia or not right okay so the pain, from the day that the ulcers heal the pain must continue minimum of 3 months is that clear so it has to continue for 3 months so only if the pain lasts for 3 months continuously for 3 months then only we call it as post herpetic neuralgia if the patient is having if the patient had the the herpes zoster last week and the ulcers were healed by last monday and today the patient is coming to us after 8 days with pain so this is still not post herpetic neuralgia so in order to call it as post herpetic neuralgia the pain must persist continue for minimum of 3 months period Thank you, sir. I think uh, Dr. Basra. Uh, I think Professor Ruan uh, has uh, answered your question. Okay. So this question is from uh, Dr. Dibenti Giri. Sir, what what is the rate of squamous cell carcinoma transformation from chronic hypoplastic candidosis? Simply, we don't know. Right? Simply, uh, the the reason why we don't know. due to the confusion with the chronic hypoplastic candidosis and leukoplakia super infected with candida so if you look at the studies where the the people has identified try to identify the malignant transformation rates uh, there are lot of challenges in the study design so therefore it is very difficult to say okay this much is transferring this much is not transferring and what we know the people who are presenting with the chronic hypoplastic candidosis they can have epithelial dysplasia and most of the time this epithelial dysplasia either reverse reduce or completely disappear once you treat them with the antifungal treatment and sometimes it is not okay uh, thank you very much thank you very much sir uh, so this question is from dr deepthi avasti why oral hair leukoplakia occur along lateral road of the tongue Mm. i don't have an explanation but we have to remember it is not only the lateral border of tongue that is there you can have it everywhere in the mouth all all the places commonest place is the lateral border of the tongue and uh, sorry i have not thought about it okay uh, thank you sir Uh, so this is from dr aravind konidena so he is a very frequent visitor to uh, visitor to our webinar sir. so okay so good evening sir how far how sorry for how many days can we use antifungal drugs in candida leukoplakia before considering it as leukoplakia so you have to continue 3 weeks and minimum of 2 weeks 2 to 3 weeks so my advice to go for 3 weeks and reassess the patient in 3 weeks time if you are just doing it for a day or two it is not going to work and then the problem is when you are using the topical and i discussed this in my leukoplakia presentation as well so if you are going to use the topical fungal applications uh, whether the fungal application is applied properly whether it is uh, used in the appropriate way whether it is tasted there appropriately we don't know so if you are having a such a situation the best thing is to go for fluconazole systemic antifungal with the lesser side effects for 2 weeks 50 mg daily 2 weeks provided that the patient is not having contraindication for it especially the liver pathology 
and wait for two weeks and then reassess the patient. That will be the idea. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So this is this question is again from him. Uh, is linear gingival erythema caused by candida? Not only by candida. That is why we called it as a candida associated lesion. There are different other organisms, especially different types of bacteria, anaerobes, which can cause a linear gingival erythema. Candida is only one organism which can give rise to uh, the linear gingival erythema. Okay, thank you, sir. So this question is again from Dr. Aravinda. Uh, is third state of denture stomatitis more common in smokers? Is third stage of danger stomatitis more common in smokers? Uh, to my understanding, there is no evidence to say so. Um, I'm not very sure. I have not come across the literature uh, describing the relationship with the third stage of uh, the danger stomatitis with the smoking. Okay, sir. So this question uh, is from anonymous attendee. During the reactivation of uh, herpes simplex viruses, we have been increased titer of anti-HSV IgM antibodies. During the reactivation, yes, because yes. there is a virus. So then the, the immune reaction is happening in the same way. Uh, only thing, when you get the reactivation, the antibodies appears quicker than with the primary disease. Because the primary disease, the virus has to be recognized by the, the immune cells and then it has to secrete the antibodies. Whereas here, the information is already there. The patient was exposed to the, the virus previously. So the B cells, the memory cells are there. So they will secrete the antibodies quickly. That's why the disease is not going to spread like in the primary disease. Okay. Uh, only thing, yes, the, the antibodies will be there, but how practical that is. We don't usually uh, use it in the, as a practical test, unless the patient is getting it very frequent. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, this question is from uh, Dr. Jayant Kumar. Sir, how is the therapeutic efficacy of clotrimazole in treating candida, candidiasis in your experience? It is a drug where the people are underused. It's very useful. Only thing, some of the preparations, it comes with the steroid. So therefore, you have to be very careful when you are using it. You have to assess the situation and decide whether you want to use the clotrimazole together with the, the steroid. Uh, but it's very useful drug. It's very effective. But it is underused. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, this question is from anonymous attendee. So could you please comment on Kawasaki disease induced by COVID-19 and its importance for dental surgeons? Right. Uh, so to start with the Kawasaki disease, whether it is induced by the COVID-19, we don't know yet. We have seen the increased number of Kawasaki disease in the era of COVID-19 pandemic. But so far, to my knowledge, they have not identified direct cause, cause and effect relationship. So it's, at least from my point of view, it is too early for us to say uh, this Kawasaki disease is due to the, the COVID. The Kawasaki disease, uh, it's a complex. It's not just the Kawasaki disease that we have seen otherwise. So this complex is considered to be an immune reaction. So as I mentioned earlier, during my first few slides, not only the virus, the, the host, our body immune reaction, is protective, useful, there are times where the people can have an effect on that. So there, here, this Kawasaki syndrome is an immune reaction against the virus and the people develop it. And the biggest problem that these people are having in addition to the other effects, especially on the cardiac system, they can have a serious lymphadenopathy. And one of the characteristic feature is the, the lymphadenopathy. It's too early for us to uh, jump into the conclusion and say, okay, Kawasaki, is, the Kawasaki disease is associated with this and that. Oh, how are we are going to manage it? Uh, the evidence is not good enough yet. 
when it comes to the COVID-19, most of the, the things we don't have the, the much of evidence. Now, a few weeks back, we were talking about the anti-malarial drugs and uh, were saying that this is the choice, but unfortunately it will not be. And now the WHO has recommended to drop it due to the side effects. So likewise, uh, we may have to wait a little until we come up with the full evidence. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, uh, next question is from uh, anonymous attendee. I think uh, you have briefly uh, explained this during your presentation. How is vitamin how is uh, vitamin deficiency can contribute to candidosis? There are different ways where the, the, uh, the, the vitamin deficiencies can contribute to the development of candidosis. The most important mechanism is the immune system. If we are not going to develop the candidosis, we have to have a strong immune system. That is one side. Number two, we know the nutritional deficiencies are having effect on the oral epithelium. So that is also again immune system. So that, that is the first line, the primary defense system. So if you are having a very good immune system, the primary defense system, the epithelium uh, functioning normally with the appropriate immune cells in the epithelium, so that will work. So when we don't have the nutrition, the appropriate nutrition, our epithelium is not going to form in the normal way and it is not going to fight with the organisms in the normal way. So that will promote the infection. That's how it is going to work. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Sir, uh, next question is also from my anonymous attendee. Sir, can we scrape out white lesions seen in hairy leukopakia? Mm, I don't know. Uh, people are treated with cryo and laser, but uh, the scraping, uh, uh, if the person is asking whether like in the, the pseudomembrane as candidosis, whether we can take it out, the answer is no, you can't. It is, uh, that's why it is called hairy leukoplakia. It is coming from the epithelium. You can't take it out. But as a therapeutically, are we going to do it? I don't know. Definitely, uh, for a diagnostic purpose, you can't. Only type of lesion which we can take it out is pseudomembranous candidosis, oral thrush. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. Okay, sir. Thank you. So, uh, this question is from uh, Dr. Bandvi Akula. Sir, can, uh, sir, you said that the only diagnosis for dif differentiating candida leukoplakia and leukoplakia is the therapeutic. To confirm it for how many days we have to advise antifungals and dosage. I think you have answered this earlier also. Yes. Uh, you can use the topical antifungals, but again, there is a problem with the application. So here we are talking about the malignant transformation and we have to confirm our diagnosis very well. So what you can do is you can give, if the patient is not having any contraindication, gluconazole 50 milligrams daily for two weeks and then wait for two weeks, go for the biopsy if the lesion is persisting. So it is leukoplakia. If it is a candida lesion, it has to be in two weeks of uh, fluconazole treatment. Yes, sir. Um, sir, next question is from Dr. Shanmuga Sundaram. Sir, in Ramsey Hunt syndrome, what would be the treatment protocol? Only acyclovir or anything else should be added? Now here, the steroid plays a role. The patient is getting facial palsy and the facial palsy may be associated with the edema. Inflammation happens in the facial canal like in the Bell's palsy. So therefore minimizing the inflammation is necessary. So this is one indication where you can add the steroid, which we discussed previously. But otherwise, other than the steroids, uh, the management is like uh, the herpes zoster. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the next question is also from an anonymous attendee. Uh, so first, uh, he or she is congratulating you for the excellent presentation. And the question is, sir, for candidosis, will it be okay to prescribe mistreating after tropical antifungal treatment in a private practice? And if needed, what will be the dosage and frequency of chewable tablet? Okay, why not? 
Basically, you can prescribe in the private practice without any issue at all. Um, only issue comes not with the nystatin, but with the systemic antifungals. And I will not advise you to prescribe other than the fluconazole, any other systemic antifungals, unless you are experienced enough, unless you have the facilities to monitor the patient and uh, check the patient for a longer period, because these are very serious. Whereas the nystatin, the side effects are very minimal because it is a topical application. And therefore, there's, I can't see any reason why you uh, but it, why can't you uh, not use it. Uh, nystatin, there are different preparations and you can use the lozenges 75,000 to 90,000 units and that is for minimum of four times. Usually we go for four times a day and you have to use it for two weeks. One point why, that you have to remember, don't use nystatin together with the clovexidine mouthwash. So if you use nystatin and the clovexidine mouthwash, there's a possibility that they form insoluble complexes. So therefore, the effect of nystatin as well as the clohexidine will be lost. So if there is any situation where you have to use both, ask the patient to use one first. We'll say use the clohexidine mouthwash. Wait for half an hour's time. Wash the mouth thoroughly. Wash the mouth very well. Wait for another half an hour's time and then go for the next drug. But I will advise you to avoid using them together if possible. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, this question is from uh, Dr. Sumitra Aryapala. So she's asking about the oral manifestations of Kawasaki's disease, uh, as this disease is common nowadays among children. I will not say it is common among the children. Uh, yes, the numbers are going up because it is not a disease which is very common. But uh, nowadays the people are talking about it because it is getting reported now so the as i as we discussed earlier whether it is associated with the covid 19 or not still it's too early to say the one of the most important presentation in the the kawasaki disease is the lymphadenopathy other than the lymphadenopathy the features the oral cavity will be like any other viral infection the patient can have vesicles the ulcerations mostly in the the posterior mouth in the throat that is the common area where the people are getting the uh, the viral infection uh, and the the, the sorry, features of the viral infection in the the mouth. But the characteristic feature will be the the lymphadenopathy. Uh, to tell you the truth, I have not come across a patient with Kawasaki disease, uh, so therefore my clinical experience with the Kawasaki disease is very limited. Okay, thank you, sir. So. So the next question is from uh, Dr. Frazir Abdul Wadud. Sir, can recurrent uh, HSV and shingles infection only occur in intraorally? Sorry, I didn't follow you. So can Sorry. recurrent HSV and shingles infection only occur in intraorally? No, you, uh, you can get it outside. In both cases, Herpes zoster, you can get it outside. And not only that, the, the primary ginger herpes stomatitis, you can get the ulcers outside. I think you have given a very lengthy description on this uh, during your presentation. Uh, Dr. Vadud, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can go through the presentation again. Thank you, Dr. Vadud. So, uh, so this question is from again anonymous attendee. What is the cause of recurrent herpes labialis? What would be your treatment of choice? The, the reason again, most of the time it is immunosuppression and the stress. The stress is causing the immunosuppression. So that is the, the commonest reason. And if a patient comes with one attack, I will not do anything other than giving a topical application to prevent the patient getting a secondary bacterial infection. Other than that, like something like a cloexidine gel. So other than that, I will not do anything. If the patient is having pain, I will give something like a paracetamol and I will advise the patient not to touch the area. So that will be my management. In few days time, usually three to four days time, the lesions will disappear. But if the patient is getting these lesions repeatedly with the very short intervals, that means there's, a, there's something wrong with the patient. 
So the patient is immunocompromised and it is important for us to identify why the patient is getting this. So we have to check the, the routine panel to see whether the patient is immunocompromised. And those patients, you can prescribe something like a cyclovacrine. Still, I don't think that these patients are needing acyclovir oral preparations. Acyclovir cream will be helpful for those patients until you identify uh, the reason for the immunosuppression. Okay, thank you very much, sir. The last question is from again anonymous attendee. Uh, I think uh, I, I think uh, we have discussed this earlier also, sir. What do you suggest for management of oral manifestations related? infections of COVID-19. So I, as I mentioned a few times, uh, it's too early for me to come up with something because whatever the evidence we have is very limited. We will see many problems coming up in the next coming weeks due to many reasons. One, uh, our involvement was very limited. Number two, the patients who were coming us to come in to us were limited. And number three, the patients who are having many other problems. And there may be different oral manifestations, oral problems of these people who will come to us. Uh, at least we will get the information in the future until such time. Sorry, uh, my, my knowledge is not good enough to answer the question. Whatever we have is the evidence that comes from here and there. There's not enough for the comprehensive evidence for us to come up and say. For me to say confidently, okay, this is this. Sorry, if you ask something about Candida, I am I can tell it confidently, but not for this one. Okay, thank you very much, sir. And uh, I think we have uh, today we have answered almost all the questions, and uh, we have omitted few as there were repetitions, and uh, that remarks the conclusion of the session. And thank you very much, everyone, for staying connected. Hope you had a fruitful session. And uh, let me once again thank uh, Professor Ruan Singha for his contribution to this session and we learn a lot from you, sir. Thank you. And uh, this is a kind reminder before we wind up, uh, the next webinar schedule will be updated on the faculty webpage soon. So please keep yourself updated. Finally, this webinar will follow up with an email and please follow the link to submit your feedback for further improvements. Uh, thank you everyone for staying connected and uh, good night. Thank you very much. And I must take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Sumudu Madhavar and his team for doing the wonderful work. Uh, other, without them, we are at a loss. I'm not a tech guy, uh, but uh, Sumudu make it a point to do the things in the appropriate way. And thank you, Sumudu and your team for doing everything. And uh, initially, we were thinking of uh, uh, stopping the, the webinars at, by today. But uh, considering the, the request that we are getting and the feedbacks that we are getting, uh, we will we will consider to continue uh, it uh, as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that encouraging uh, comments. Uh, uh, so good night, <laughs> good night everyone. Good night.